Hey guys, happy Sunday. Welcome to It's Such a Live. I'm your host, Kelly Barrett. I am super excited tonight. I have a guest that if you have ever listened to the radio, you are already familiar with his work. Uh, he is a, a Grammy Award-winning Juno nominated music producer, as well as an author. Uh, but we're going to launch right in here and please welcome Mark Howard. Mark, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. We have a lot to talk about, um, mainly your second book that's just come out. Uh, you are one interesting human, Mark Howard. You've had some very interesting experiences. Uh, can you tell us some of the people that you've worked with that we're going to be talking about in this book? Yeah, um, well, I'm, uh, yeah, like you said, I'm a little bit of an odd bird where I don't make records in the normal way in recording studios. I I pick locations and it's very much almost like a film shoot where I find cool locations like a 1920s, you know, beautiful movie star estate uh, villa in the middle of Hollywood, or it could be uh, uh, um, 1940s Mexican porno cinema that I turned into a studio or like all these different locations. And so <clears throat> over the years, you know, I've, I've made uh, kind of, I made two records with Bob Dylan and two records with R.E.M. and and work with Peter Gabriel and U2 and uh, uh, Willie Nelson and Emmy Lou Harris and a, a lot of the the classic uh, writers and singers. So I, I've been kind of uh, lucky to been able to kind of catch that end of that era. You know, like it was uh, like For sure. that. That's going to be. It's going to be. You know. There was only one chance, and I think I got it. And so I think you did. Like, and, with, and, go yeah. ahead. I was going to say we could add know, to and and to yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say we can add to the list. You know, you two and Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters and Tom Waits. I have a list here, and it's like the who's who of yeah. anybody, <laughs> like Grammy award winning yeah. artists. So, so yeah, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, Mark, can you take us back a little bit and and give us a little bit of history? Like you know how you got launched. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Um, well, I've I'm a drummer by by trade. Uh, you know, as a kid, nine years old, I was uh, taking drum lessons at the Ontario Conservatory of Music there in Hamilton, Ontario, and that kind of led to. Uh, it's an interesting thing that what I what happened when I was a kid. I've just never stopped doing it. And so I had my parents' basement and I turned it into kind of like a um, kind of like a nightclub. And I had like a took the ping pong table and turned it into a drum riser. And then we had speakers and couches and, you know, all hippie posters and black lights. Right. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of like a, a cool place to hang out for the, the kids. And we would be in a band. And, you know, so it was a. Uh, it was a, a, a way that started. And then once I, um, I had quit school when I was 15 and uh, I, I thought I was wanted to be an architect. And funny enough, cool. I found a, um, found a place in Hamilton, Ontario called Howard Mark Architect. And I thought, oh, wow. Oh, Howard, I, <laughs> they'll, they'll give me a job. So I went in there and yeah. So I showed him some of my drawings and buildings that I kind of drew and kind of futuristic. And the guy said, I love it. It's like, go back to school and get your grade 12. And I said, no, I'm not going back to school. So I ended up getting a job for kind of like a, a lighting and PA company. And so I would do all a bunch of local gigs kind of around town, setting PA and lights up. And, and then kind of like, uh, and then I learned how to mix, you know, because I was, oh, you got to mix these shows and stuff like that. And so um, it it ended up that uh, in Hamilton, they had this place called the Leander Boat Club. And what it was is they would have all these blues acts coming through from America. And so uh, the PA company said, well, you just do all those blues acts. And so it was like I was getting like all these classic old blues guys coming through and, you know, Albert King and, you know, like all these uh, amazing blues players. I'm getting my blues experience. Uh, ex education from you know right and so as as i look back at it you know working with dylan and telling him about you know little walter or albert collins and it's like how do you know all these blue people blues people and i said you know i worked with all these guys right, right. so he was pretty impressed yeah so because he's that's his he loves blues and stuff like that so so yeah so um so from there i, I ended up 
kind of going on the road with uh, right across Canada with a classic uh, harmonica player called King Biscuit Boy. And King yes. Biscuit Boy was like Canada's most legendary harmonica player, blues player. And he, uh, so I went on tour mixing the shows and, you know, seven guys and a dog and a cube van from Toronto to Vancouver. And then that was, Vancouver was our first gig. So it was pretty a, a rough ride. And so I got my taste of touring early on. And so I, after that, I had come back to uh, Hamilton and just doing, you know, kind of like the local Ontario scene and stuff like that. And then I ended up getting in a motorcycle accident uh, on my uh, 1971 Norton 750. I was in the rain and I was just coming down uh, Cannon Street and a car pulled in front of me and bang, I hit it. I flew over it and I landed on my feet like a cat. And <laughs> so I wasn't hurt other than the shock of it. And right. so I, I couldn't go back on the road because 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 I was like, you know, I was all sore and stuff. So I ended up getting a job making coffee at this local studio called Grand Avenue Studio in Hamilton, Ontario. And um, I'd only worked there maybe a couple of months. And next thing I know, I'm like the chief night engineer doing like all these kind of like syndicated radio shows. And and, uh, you know, like one show was like TNT. He did like the top 10, you know, country hits and stuff like that. And so through working there, um, uh, the studio was owned at the time um, by um, Bob Deutsch who, and his wife. And so they took me on with a Canadian program that they were, had there where they would pay half the wage. The government of Canada would pay half my wage and the studio would pay the other half. And so, they thought, oh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll take you on. And, so I wasn't there very long, and next thing I know, this guy, uh, producer of U2 and Peter Gabriel, Daniel Lamois, he came through the door to start uh, on his uh, solo record. And so um, uh, usually people in the studio are very slow and like you're plugging microphones, in, but because I had the road experience, like, you know, I'm always right. like, so I've treated it, treat it like a live show. Bang, you got to get this plugged in, bang. Okay, here we go now. And so with musicians, you can't leave them in a room long times in a booth or whatever, you know, because they got bored. So you got to right. be on top of it. So so he was always trying to stunt, stump me in the studio. It's like, OK, we're going to do a guitar overdub, put it on channel 12 and uh, use that uh, amp out there. I said, it's already plugged in. Here we go. And he's like, what? <laughs> it's like it's like I anticipated that they were going to make doing a, a, so, um, a guitar overdub. And and so I was just like more on it and so uh so he was impressed by you know how how i worked and and then next thing i know he called me up and he said would you come to new orleans with me and help me make a record with this band called the neville brothers and so i'm like you know i've never heard of the neville brothers and so and i was telling my friend yeah i'm going to new orleans to work with the everly brothers and that's <laughs> good I didn't, he was like wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so i think wow and so so i get to new orleans and and uh, it was only supposed to be for six months and so the thing was as i met dan in the french quarter i'd never been to new orleans before and it was pretty risky down there and uh the french quarter is you know kind of a crazy place right. and so i he was only staying for two days and he said okay I need you to uh, find a place to make this record with the Neville Brothers. I need you to bring all the equipment in from England, Canada, and buy some stuff in New York and stuff like that. And there was no computers, and you only had a phone. And I had, and he gave me a couple of phone numbers. He said, right. I'm going to England to work with Brian. You know, I'll, I'll be back in a month. Find a place, have it set up. We're going to start the record as soon as I get back. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I'm 20 years old. It's like, I've never never done anything like this. And so I had to become like a real estate broker to find a place. And then I had to, you know, be a equipment broker to bring the equipment into the country and figure out how to not to pay, you know, duties and taxes and stuff right. like that. And so, uh, so I was wearing many hats and, and then, so he ended up showing up and uh, we started uh, this record with the Neville brothers. And it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty interesting uh, record because I never knew much about them, but they were, they're really the leader, um, uh, the pioneers of funk music. And so uh, right. I liked funk music. And so it, it was, it was great. We go to this uh, club called Tipitina's and we, so I got an idea what they were like live, but in the right. studio, what happens is, is uh, 
to capture what they do live is different. You know, it's like in the studio, you don't have an audience. You don't have, so you got to come at making records in a different angle. So, because right. so, if they just played it live, it wouldn't have that that vibe kind of thing because you're they're relying off the audience and all that stuff. So without an audience, you got to come up with new ideas and new ways to, to make it. So um, I had the, what's called the control room with all of the recording equipment in a bedroom. And then I had another room in, in a living room that I had the drum set up and what would, we were calling the performance room, but we ended right. up working only in the bedroom and, and everybody was in the, with microphones and I had the speakers on and, and so the, the record was uh, made with percussion instruments. And, and so it was kind of like done in kind of levels and stuff. Uh, so it was, it was, we create a vibe, put it down, they'd sing on top of it. And, and that's kind of like how the record was made. And so we had um, uh, towards the end of the record, Dan had invited uh, Brian Eno, who is a, um, a pioneer of ambient music. And so he came in to help. Uh, and so I, I didn't know who he was really at the time. And, and so, um, Dan said, go to the airport, pick him up and bring him, bring him to the studio. And, and, and you're going to be working with him in the mornings. And so, okay. And so I go to the airport and I, Dan said, take a sign with you. And like, I'm not holding up a sign. And so uh, all these people were coming off the plane uh, and I would just go, Brian, right. Right. And, and so, and then it ended up this little uh, uh, English gentleman comes off and he just, he caught my eye and he goes, Ma? And I said, yes, yes, that's me. And so we jumped in uh, the car and, he, and the first thing he said to me, he goes, uh, I want you to take me to uh, Storyville before we go to the uh, studio. And I'm like, Storyville? Storyville. And so Story, Storyville was uh, uh, a very... Um, kind of a, a risky place where they had prostitution and they had uh, it and, and it was it was abolished in 1940 <clears throat> so it was like it's where the sailors would go and, right. and you would hear about you know those brothels where everybody would go and and that was really the start of like the blues and and all those old blues guys would play in these brothels and stuff like that and so uh, he had been reading about it, thinking that it was still alive, but it was abolished in the 40s. So I, I drove him through the French Quarter, to, you know, say, saying, you know, uh, this is kind of like what it was like, but it was right. it's not really there anymore. So so we ended up getting to the studio. And um, so I started working with Brian in the morning. So he's very uh, a master of kind of like taking sounds and manipulating them. And so um, what he did with Roxy Music, he would be on stage with them, but he would have all of the instruments come to him through a mixer. And then he would take those sounds and put them through effects and then re put them back out as a completely different sound. And so he would that was his whole job with Roxy Music. So he ha had this way of making like crazy sounds out of nothing. So I learned his technique and uh, it's a lot of. Uh, uh, floating signals and just you're only hearing a reverb, not the real source. And then you take that reverb and put it through some delays. And so you're just getting all this kind of like kind of backlog of the sound. And so it, it turns into more of a like a piano would be like dum dum, and then the result would be you know like a very strange ab ambient right. kind of like texture. And so, so I had learned these things early on and, with him and kind of, I, I kind of, kind of not mastered my own way, but I have a, a certain technique that I use that, those kind of things to, you know, when, when you're, when the track is missing something, you want to build something mysterious out of it and, and stuff like that. And so you hear it on like the U2 records and all those beautiful intros and all those high uh, sounds that come on and on, you know, still haven't. Uh, found what you're looking for and so yeah so uh so we were i was working with brian brian and he had this keyboard and it was called a yamaha dx7 which was oh kind of yes like a i know those. keyboard <laughs> oh yeah. yeah but he had he he had taken all the sounds and manipulated them so it was like all like he had cricket sounds he had like all these weird kind of like uh weird frequencies and stuff like that and so so we were working on this one track the Nub brothers and he was playing these kind of like uh, insect noises and outside I had the window open 
and outside there was these they're kind of like cicada bugs like they make this kind of like high frequency noise and so brian had played a melody on the dx7 with these kind of insect noises and so he's like, dun, 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 dun. and so then the insects outside go <laughs> and i'm like oh my god he's <laughs> communicating with he's communicating with these insects he's brian, the bug whisperer try a, I, I, I said, try a different melody just to see if it's real. And it's like, right. So we did it, and sure enough, they followed it. It was, it was very, no. a very straight. Yeah, it was, a, it was really having a communication with these bugs. It was pretty, That's pretty crazy. interesting. And so, yeah, so, so yeah. It, it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting. And, uh, and this is my first experience, really you know, making records, you know, because in Hamilton, I was just kind of like country bands here and there. And then suddenly, you know, I get thrown into Brian Eno. like the, the deep, Brian Eno deep and, you know, it's like, and, and so, uh, so yeah, so it was interesting because, you know, I had to do everything, you know, like Lanois was the producer, but I had to, you know, like I said, bring in, set up all the gear and we were only there for six months. And so I found this apartment building on St. Charles Avenue. It's kind of like uptown, area of new orleans and or the garden district was very beautiful and so there's all these big huge antebellum mansions and you know the big pillars and stuff like yeah. that so i found this i found this apartment building it was five-story apartment building it was for sale so i i was working with this uh um uh, real estate guy david zolkine <laughs> and he would i would just call him up and said check this property out and whatever and so I said, I found this apartment building. Can you contact the owner? It's for sale and see if we can make a deal with them. And so right. I ended up getting it for like $1,500 a month, but I gave him six months up front. So it was like $10,000 or whatever and, and for the six months. And so he took it and I got of this course like he did. amazing, <laughs> amazing, huge. Yeah. And so I put the studio on one floor and Dan stayed on the penthouse in the top and it was kind of dilapidated. But it had air conditioning and and it was uh, it was workable. And so but Great. the studio was on the second floor. So I had to hire a bunch of guys to carry all the gear up to the second floor. And, and the console was like 10 feet long. We had to tip it up on its end and, and jug it around these stairs going up. And we had a rule. If you, no, you no. have to lose a thing, we, you'd have to lose a finger before you dropped it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like a yeah. so, no pressure. And then the taper. Book, yeah. And the 24 track tape recorder was like a huge refrigerator. And I had to take it apart into two sections to be able to carry it up because it was probably, you know, you know, two, 2000 pounds, you know, altogether. It was, it was pretty, pretty tough. So we ended up um, uh, kind of finishing off that record there with the Neville Brothers, which became uh, Yellow Moon, which is a really beautiful sounding record. And Aaron Neville, you know, was had sang. Two, uh, we did two covers of two Bob Dylan songs. Uh, one was, uh, um, uh, what was it called? Um, uh, uh, Hollis Brown. And then the other one was, uh, uh, God, I can't remember. But it was the one of the most beautiful ones. Um, but so, so because of, we had done that, um, Dan had gotten a phone call at the end of the record saying, uh, from Bono from U2 and Bono would, was was just with Bob Dylan and Bono was telling uh, Dylan that he should work with this guy Daniel Lamois and so uh, so it came around to uh, oh yeah so the other Bob Dylan song was called God on Our Side which is a really incredible yeah. beautifully written song and uh, so uh, Dylan was playing New Orleans at the uh, at the at the zoo uh, the Ottoman Zoo, and so uh, we got an invite to go see Dylan there, and so uh, you know we saw the show, and then you know right after the show they shuffle Bob right off off the stage and onto the bus, and then we we got invited onto the bus, and so wow. um, they they met for the first time and said oh yeah, and so Dylan said well what are you guys doing here in town, and so Dan said we're making this record with the Neville Brothers, you know you should stop by and have a listen, we cut a couple of your tracks. He goes really? And we said yeah. So he ended up uh, the next day. Dylan comes to the studio or to the the apartment building where we were uh, to listen to him, and he hears Hollis Brown. And he goes, yeah, that's cool. 
And then, but when he heard uh, uh, the, the other track, it was like, wow, this is really incredible. And so that's kind of like how uh, the start of uh, Oh Mercy record, uh, Bob Dylan became uh, oh, oh Mercy. And, uh, and I had to find another house. So suddenly now I got to like read, find a house to make his record in. And so Dan said, I want you to go to Santa Fe, New Mexico and find a house because we should we will we'll go there and make his Bob Dylan's record there. So I, I fly to Santa Fe and I got like one of those old fashioned video recorders and I kind of videotape a bunch of houses. And so I ended up finding uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's old house that she had uh, moved into just before she died. It was like Great. a beautiful adobe estate. And and so it was like perfect to make a record. And so I was all excited about it. And I got back and I showed Dan the, the videotape and he goes, oh, this looks great. And so next thing I know, he's on the phone to Bob and he's telling Bob, we got a great place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's like uh, George O'Keefe's place. And it's so beautiful. And, and uh, Bob goes, Santa Fe. And uh, Dan goes, yeah, it's, it's incredible there. And she goes, I can't work in Santa Fe. And Dan goes, well, why? Why? And Bob goes, uh, well, it's because of the altitude. It's too oh. high. The altitude is high, and you're always oh, uh, looking for your breath when you're singing. And, stuff. Oh, wow. and, and so he didn't. So he didn't want to make a, a record there. So I ended up coming back to New Orleans, and I found this house in the uh, Garden District on Sonyat Street, really in the beautiful section of the Garden District. It was really, really beautiful, and so. I did the same thing. It was for sale and we made a deal and we got the house and it had a pool and it had a courtyard with guest houses and stuff like that, which, Perfect. which they call in New Orleans, they called the guest quarters slave quarters. Oh, right, and we yeah. found out we weren't allowed to say that, you know, it was like, you know, like, cause you know, we're working with black people and, and they, that was not cool. And so, uh, not so correct yes. at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't, they're not coming from Canada. It was like, like I had no clue. And, so anyways, uh, so we ended up making a record with uh, Bob Dylan in this beautiful Victorian mansion in the Garden District uh, right after the Neville Brothers. And uh, so um, it was it was kind of a crazy uh, uh, thing where Bob would only work at night. So we'd have to like wait for him to come. He'd show up maybe four o'clock or, or later. And right. so uh, it, it was it was interesting. And and so for the first Kind of like I'd say for the first week or week and a half of the record, um, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was I was supposed to be the assistant, but as a Malcolm Byrne, uh, another engineer, was supposed to be the engineer, and so, but he was a musician, so he ended up, you know, uh, playing a lot. So I would have to record a a, a lot of it because you know he was playing an instrument, a keyboard or something like that, and so I. I like right in there with recording Dylan right away. It was like, uh, that's like my second record is a Dylan record, which I Jesus. thought was pretty, uh, like lucky. And uh, Mark, so, I have, to, uh, I have I, to stop you for a second here, Mark, because I have to sort of interrupt you. I have to ask you at this point, because you're kind of like, oh, you know, pick up Brian Eno from the airport, like as you do, and then record Bob Dylan as you do. <laughs> is there ever a point where you're freaking blown away as a young man that you're, you know, I'm recording um, with Bob Dylan, and yeah, well, it's uh, I, I, for whatever reason, because I'm working and I'm doing a job, uh, I don't get starstruck because I have to work with them, you know. Right. It's like, and so you you end up on on a different kind of level uh, when you're working with an artist, <laughs> and so you you talk about other things and stuff like that, or and so like with Bob Dylan, you know, uh, uh, I found a connection with him. Uh, not with music, with uh, motorcycles, and so I had oh, cool. a, an old motorcycle outside, parked in the in the courtyard, and he'd always look, come over, and I, you know, I'd be kind of like doing something to it or whatever, you know, fixing something on it, and he's like, "Hey, can you get me one of those?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, my friend in Florida is he, he <clears> deals <throat> with all vin vintage motorcycles, and so he he ended up taking the money from his art budget and he gave it to me." And I went to Florida on the weekend and I got him like oh, this beautiful 19, I got him a beautiful 1966 uh, Harley Davidson, uh, uh, what's called the shovel head, Electroglide. Right. And it was beautiful. Yeah, beautiful blue. It was like really stunning. And so, uh, 
we kept, became like motorcycle kind of friends and you know we talk about motorcycles and stuff and, but i would take him out on the, uh, in the mornings he would show up at the studio a little earlier and so i would take him along the levee and take him all along the uh, the mississippi river and we come down into those old beautiful <laughs> uh, plantation roads you know and it's like going through tunnels but they're like beautiful trees hanging and moss and and so i would show him where to ride and and so then he would go out by himself sometimes. And one time he came to the studio and uh, I heard him uh, start his bike up and, and I heard him pull out, but then I heard him stall around the corner. And so I ran around to find out what's going on. And so when I got to him, he's sitting on his bike and he's just looking straight ahead. And there's all these people around and going, Bob, can we get your autograph? And he just oh, sat no. there like they weren't even there. And I, I, so I ran up, I said, come on, leave this guy alone, you know, whatever. Yeah. So they, they left him. So I looked down. He had forgot to put the petcock uh, gas on. So he ran out of gas around the corner. So I turned that on oh, no. and started the bike up. And then so he would ride around the New Orleans with no helmet on. This is in New Orleans and, you know, the late 80s. And uh, and so in California, there was no helmet laws, but there was helmet laws in, in Louisiana. So he would come back from his ride. And he goes, the police are mighty family here. Uh, um, they keep waving at me, and I'm like, Bob, they're waving at you because you don't have a helmet on. They're trying to tell you to pull over, or put something on your head, and so, uh, so yeah, so it was, uh, so that's 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 how kind of like with certain musicians, you just find uh, another way, and and with Neil Young, it was about cars, and I like old vintage cars, and I got a couple myself, and stuff like that. So right, you and just I think find. Dylan find D yeah. Dylan was obviously very impressed with you, though, because I was I was reading a quote uh, where you worked with Daniel Langlois and him on his Time Out of Mind album, um, which he ended yeah. up winning three, three Grammys for, including Album of the Year. Yep. Yeah. And he mentioned he yeah. mentioned you in his acceptance speech, and he said, yeah. yeah, we we got a particular sound on this record which you don't get every day. What a compliment yeah. coming from Bob Bob Dylan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a uh, you know like when when we started his his record uh he was between where he lived in uh uh on the uh, malibu coast he lived uh kind of just after malibu and then we were working at a, at this my studio called the Te La teatro uh el, el teatro and what it was is a 1940s mexican porn cinema that was like soft porn you know like topless but kind of right. like funny kind of porn you know like the one guy was called Horsehead and the other guy was El Macho and they were funny kind of naughty Can't kind be, of movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, so w I was working there. And so between his house and where this was in Oxnard, California, it was an hour. And so between that, along the coast, he would tune into these old blues radio shows and that he could only get them in that little spot and then they would just disappear somehow they were broadcasting maybe they were like pirate radio from uh, offshore or something like that but and so he goes why do these old blues records sound so amazing like why can't my records sound like that i said they can we just have to approach it from that angle with old ribbon mics and you know just a different less is more the less you use the, right. the more sound you get and so so i took it as a, a kind of like a 1940s or 50s type of recording you know so I, I would only use one or two mics on the drum set and then you know just kind of like old kind of like tube amps and and all old microphones and so it ended up uh we got a sound a particular sound on our record that you don't get every day and that's what you don't saying. get every day so, yeah. and i'm wondering mark i'm yeah. wondering if there's certain types of voices or musical styles that present a bit of a challenge because i understand that bob dylan introduced you to marianne faithful who i love yeah and yeah. and Apparently, Dylan said to her, you know, people like us with funny voices, you know, we have to be kind of careful about who produces you. And I'm, and that being said, I'm wondering, are there certain types of voices or musical styles that are more of a challenge to produce properly? Um, well, as you look at the list of people that I work with, like everybody's got an interesting Tom Waits, you know. Yeah, Tom Waits. Of, and Willie Nelson. He's like a kind of quirky sounding voice. And so they're not really classified as great singers but they're more character singers it's like 
right. they have a voice that is undeniably them. You know, it's like, and that's very. In the first Marianne, two notes, you know who it is, Marianne yeah, for sure. You know yeah. who it is, yeah, Marianne, yeah. Uh, Bob, Neil Young. You know, like uh, so. So I, I've been able to like record all of the classic, you know, interesting voices where, you know, other people recorded Celine Dion and like all these like yeah. beautiful singers, glorious, but for sure, you know, they don't have, they're not writers like Bob or Neil or, or Joni, you know, like, it's like, those are, those are the people that, you know, really they write their own songs and sing them. And that's, that's, that's the uh, thing about, um, singers you know you have a lot of beautiful singers out there but they don't write and right. so like aaron neville he is probably one of the most beautiful singers on the planet but he doesn't write his songs and so when aaron neville was uh uh had his first uh number one hit tell it like it is in the 50s um he was in uh, prison for armed robbery because he was like the like when he when he sang that song uh, I did it at Alan Toussaint studio in, in New Orleans. And they said, Aaron, here's a hundred dollar bill. We want you to sing the song. And he'd never seen a hundred dollar bill in his life. And he's, he said he did it just to be able to take that hundred and go back and show his mom, look, I got a hundred dollars to sing a song. Right. And then it became number one. And, and, you know, like he, he was poor, had no money after that. And uh, he ended up robbing, you know, something and, got caught and went was in prison and imagine being in prison and you hear your song on the radio. It's like right. number one this week. It's like, yeah, so it was, that ought to earn you a little bit of, that would only earn you a little bit of street cred in the cells. I'm, I would imagine that gets you. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah can well, you mark, um, can you? Uh, his, yep. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say back to Marianne faithful for a minute here. Can you tell us, can you share with the viewers the story that you were sharing with me about her before the show? <laughs> uh yeah um well Ma marianne is uh she's very much like the queen she's like mark we must go to dinner you know it's like she's very <laughs> proper and and very it's like it's, it's crazy uh, but she likes to uh, have a little bit of the sauce you know so she says mark it's <laughs> cocktail time i'm going to just go across the street and have a little cocktail i'll be right back and i was like okay man so she goes has a drink <laughs> and it's like this me mexican restaurant across the street called Salido's and it's like all Mexican jukebox and it's like but you can get drinks there like heavy duty and so she would come back and she would be kind of a little bit uh you know uh drunk right <laughs> and so she'd be like and so she'd come in and then she just goes to, straight to foul mouth and you mock you effing see <laughs> it's like like oh my god Marianne please <laughs> and so yeah so she was uh she was a character, and I don't know if you know the history of her, but, you know, she was like one of the most beautiful women on the planet uh, in the 60s. And she'd already had a career, you know, uh, uh, television and records. And so she was actually more popular than the Rolling Stones in those days. And so Mick wow. Jagger started uh, dating her. And uh, and so it was uh, an interesting thing where. Uh, the police raided, uh, I think it was uh, Keith Richards' house, and they were having a party, and the police raided it, and they found Marianne naked, you know, on a bearskin rug. And so the story goes, it's uh, they found a Mars bar, and not, I'm going to say where it was, but oh uh, the police. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so it was all this news That's about in one. England. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was huge press, like, you know, like that they found Marianne face down with this thing in her and all this stuff. And so, uh, so Marianne walks into the teatro, this beautiful cinema that I've got as the studio. And as we're walking in, she kind of nudges me and she goes, you know, Mark, it's not true. It's not. I go, oh, 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 yes, of course it's not true. Of course <laughs> it's not. Like, you never believed it for a second. <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's all she said. It's like, no, it's not true. <laughs> so I says, okay, fine, yeah. So did she at one so, point yeah. work have a? Didn't she at one point have a tray of pills? Or, uh, well, she she uh, after the record, she went off and uh, was doing press on the record and. Uh, and, you know, it was like every press is like, Marianne, what was this and that? And so she was just tired of telling the same stuff all the time. So she would make up stories like, 
Well, in the studio, Mark had midgets walking around with trays with different colored pills, and we could just pick each one for you know how we felt at that time. And so I was like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, "That did not happen. <laughs> I don't have drugs in the studio." And so, and and you know, she'd be like, "Mark, I need some coke." I'm like, "Okay, Marianne, I don't know where to get it." He goes, "Mark, I must do some writing. I need some right now." And so, all right, we'll, we'll have to find you something. We'll call some people, I guess. You know, hey? so was, yeah, yeah. And so, but you know, she well, was, um, she, yeah, she, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to, oh, you could stay on the Marianne Faithful thing. I was going to ask you about Robert Plant, but finish your Marianne Faithful story. Yeah, uh, just one more little kind of, yes, you know, kind of go drug ahead. story. You know, everybody, everybody wants to know about drugs. So, um, everyone does. So, yeah, so she, uh, she was when she was uh, young and uh, she had much success, uh, started dating uh, Mick Jagger. And so she became a junkie. She was uh, hooked on heroin. And so uh, Mick really wanted to help her out. So um, Mick flew her to Los Angeles. And as soon as she landed, the tour manager picked her up, took her right to the <coughs> desert, to Joshua Tree, took her off the heroin, dried her up. And then when, when, when she was sober and clean and stuff like that, manager took her put a bow on her and then took her to uh, uh, Mick's door at the hotel and knocked on it and so Mick opened up and there's this new prize <laughs> like clean and oh, so I love yeah, that it was a nice I love story. That story yeah beautiful yeah. story yeah and I was gonna yeah. ask you about Robert Plant so, because I know I've got a yeah we want to hear about yeah. him yeah yeah um so Robert was a um uh, a record that we got offered or Dan got offered to produce, uh, which was the uh, second record to Raisin Sand, which was with uh, Robert and um, Alison Krauss. And so we had made arrangements to, to work with them. And so uh, we were working out of this house in Los Angeles in Silver Lake. It was kind of like a old, uh, you know, beautiful 20s villa and that, you know, I was working in the hallway of this villa with a spiral staircase and I just had all my gear set up in the hallway. And uh, so uh, Allison couldn't make it the first leg of it. So uh, Robert showed up by himself and, you know, so Robert comes in the door and he's got a leather satchel and, and he goes, this is all of the, 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 um, the songs and words that I've written about all of the women that I've loved and hated. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's some good fuel. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so he came in, and and it's the same thing, you know. Like, you know, um, you know, it, you know, Robert is like, you know, a hero hero of mine. You know, growing up listening to Led Zeppelin, uh, yeah, like, that was as good as it got for me. And that was, you know, but because you know you're working with him, so you gotta, you know, um, deal with him on a different level of starstruck or anything like that. So I of didn't course. have any of that stuff. Uh, so, so it was, it was interesting to work with him because, uh, he's older now and he doesn't want to sing high. He, he's, he says, I can't sing high anymore. For and sure it so happens. I said, okay. Yeah. And yeah, 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 of course it happens. And then, so we, he's infatuated with, uh, African rhythms and stuff like that. He, this is, he loves, uh, uh, Senegal and all these different places in Africa. And he brought in this little, uh, the, dvd of where he was in in uh, africa working with these uh, africans and so we took this approach with him the kind of like with uh, african beats and stuff like that and uh and we put um built on top of it so you i made a loop out of one of these african things and then we just everybody played on top of it and so so he's singing from you know his little satchel of songs and so uh he's also got a book there by a, a uh, amazing poet called William Blake, who's very famous. And so uh, a lot of people, um, you know, praise it, rub him uh, for all of his uh, poetry and stuff like that. So right. uh, sure enough, you know, Robert was like scouring through the book and oh, that's a good line. I'm like, OK. And so, you like know, as, as they do. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as they do. And so he's there was a one kind of lyric or beautiful girl or something like that. And so. We had this one track, uh, and we, he, he was like, um, he called it "Beautiful Girl" and about all the, the beautiful women of in his life, and so the story went on and stuff like that. 
And so it, it was interesting to see him, you know, kind of like build a song in the studio uh, from nothing and, you know, pick through all of his uh, satchel uh, notes and stuff. And uh, so um, he ended up uh, coming with, um, what was it? A, uh, a, a, a We did four songs and, and then Allison was supposed to come in. But before that, um, we would... Uh, listen every night uh, after we uh, our day's work. And then um, Robert's uh, manager would, would come in and listen. And uh, so we, we would all have a drink a after work and it was kind of cool, but um, we were working, um, you know, in this house and it had a pool table and there was a bunch of f photographs on the pool table of, of kind of like nude artists, kind of right. like, uh, Sadek and like all these amazing photographs that uh, Daniel was looking at to, to buy or whatever. And so I showed uh, Robert, I said, what do you think of this one? It was like this naked girl on a couch. And he goes, oh, I could never be with a woman that young. You know, I would have to be with a woman in her 30s, you know, I'm like, oh, oh my God, God. <laughs> I wasn't asking about that. And so so it was like, uh, so you kind of like, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, he got busted with 12 year old girls, I guess, in their days. And so I, I think he's trying to like, uh, trying to repair that, repair that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Idea of exactly. is, there any, is there anybody, Mark, that's been really difficult to work with? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. There's always I'm sure. somebody, uh, yeah, but usually younger people. Uh, I've, I, I had incredible, um, experiences working with, you know, uh, you know, Dylan and Neil, and they, they just let you do what you want. And, and younger artists become very difficult. And I want to sound like this. I want to be like Radiohead. I want to be like this. And it's like, you know, it's like, that's, you're not going to, you know, have your own sound if you're going to be following the path of everybody else. So, Good you know, I, 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 yeah. So I'd worked with Mumford and son. They were like, uh, I met him at the hotel cafe in uh, LA and they were just on a tour in a van with a bunch of people. And so um, I went and met them in the back alley. And so they were a big, big Dylan fan. So they're, you know, asking me about making these records with Bob and stuff. And so uh, I ended up working with them and, and they were probably pretty uh, bickering with each other. And it was just like, it was, it was like pulling teeth, you know, so it was uh, not a fun situation, but um I made a deal. I made an EP with them, and if it, they got signed with that EP, that I produced their record. They got signed with the EP, and they didn't hire me to produce the record. <laughs> like, oh wow! So I, I uh, yeah. So they're on my bad list. <laughs> right? No, no Christmas gifts for you, people. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Exactly. Right, and I'm, I can't yeah. help but ask too about Iggy Pop because I figure I think Iggy Pop must have been a bit crazy, a bit of a wild man to work with. And you would confuse his it's, wife's uh, name and his cat's name, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, well, Iggy is, uh, he's probably one of my favorite to work with. You know, right. like I, I made two records, two records with him, one in New Orleans and one in New York. And uh, he's, he's a really interesting uh, singer because he doesn't have anything written down and he'll, we'll do three takes in a row. And in those three takes, he will change the lyrics on each take. And he, they're just, he's just the rhymes coming out of him left and right. And it was like, and you got to think, well, that take two had an amazing verse there. And, but take three, he's got that awesome ending. And it's like, you got to like, you know, kind of pick the best of the bunch and stuff like that. So, and so I think he doesn't get credited to how brilliant he really is. He's a really amazing writer. And, uh, you know, and there's always like a, a lyric, like, you know, there was Jewish poets who don't know it. And like, he's always right. got like, these kind of like cool little lines that come out of him, and and so you think like he's going to be this wild guy, right? But he's such a very intellectual, and he likes likes to be home for four o'clock to watch the CNN news, and you know, like he's like oh, very, wow, eh? uh, he's very soft spoken, and and so with with the you know his name's Jim, and so uh, um, but on stage he's Iggy. And so he winds himself up before the show and he becomes Iggy Pop. And so right, after the right. show, uh, after the show, he doesn't come down for a minute. 
So I'd be backstage and see him come off stage and I follow him in. I go, hey, hey, uh, Iggy, uh, that was great. And he goes, so who are you? I go, it's Mark from the record. He goes, oh, 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 Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, a, it's, a, it's a very strange thing for somebody to, to become somebody else, you know, like to that degree, like to that degree. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, it was pretty interesting to see. It's like, well, you don't remember me. <laughs> like, how right, can you not? Like, you what? Know? Yeah. It's like, you know, you spend so, months in the studio with somebody, you're arm to arm. And it's like, it's like you become brothers almost. It's, it's, right. And, and then suddenly they're, they're gone and they're on tour. And so, and then become something else. But yeah. So, but yeah, so he maybe- was super nice. Yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed working with Iggy. It's interesting to hear about that alter ego because I think a lot of artists around that time, you know, Bowie, for example, a lot of the yeah, people yeah, that he would do it. mentored and back and forth emulated it, there was that alter ego just like with Bowie. And, and so that's interesting to hear yeah. that about him. Um, and I have to ask about the Tragically Hip because they are my favorite band on the planet. And I know you know okay. anything you can tell yep. us about the hip. I know there's a lot of hip fans that watch this show. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I yeah, I met them. They came to New Orleans and they made a record uh, with, uh, I think his name was Don Smith, another producer from L.A. And so uh, I kind of, um, I was I didn't work on that record that they came in to do that. I was just kind of like babysitting them at the house stuff and making sure everything worked for them. And so uh, so that that's kind of how I met them originally. And so they were like pot smoking, beer drinking, kind of like, you know, you know, like my buddies in Hamilton, you know, like, uh, like right. just kind of like the nature of how Canadian people party. Yeah. And right. so um, we ended up, uh, I was working with uh, uh, Daniel Lamois first record and we went out on a tour and tragically uh, invited us to, I think it was called the roadside attraction or, yes, or yes, one, of those, yeah. one of the, one of those big tours that they did. And uh, so um, during that tour, they had Midnight Oil and a band called Hot House Flowers, Crash Vegas. Right. And uh, a couple other bands. And so uh, what it was is um, uh, the lead singer uh, from Midnight Oil was uh, he's a pro uh, kind of a protester. He's always protesting something. Right. right. So very was, political. Yeah. Yeah. Very political. And so yeah. they were protesting about uh the, the land in Van, in West Coast, how they're chopping down all these trees and leaving big, huge sections of the, the mountain bare and all this stuff like that. And people were like gluing their testicles to, you know, the trees and all this stuff. And it was crazy. So we decided to do a song to, 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 to uh, you know, to bring awareness to um, to the situation that probably not a lot of people knew about. And so... Uh, so what we did is while we were on the road, uh, every everybody, every band singer would write a verse for uh, a song that was called Land. And so what we did, I think it was maybe in Winnipeg. We just kind of like after the show, we just all huddled into a little studio. And um, and so we did uh, we used Lamois band and then everybody just came up and did a verse and. Cool. And so yeah. so I think at that point, uh, the guys in the hip, they thought, wow, this guy is really good at getting fast sounds. And he's really, you know, sees how they saw how I work. You know, I'm like right on it and bang, bang, bang. You're in next air. I was like, like, it's like, you know, uh, really fast for for them to see because they're used to being stoned and drunk all the time. So <laughs> I need somebody mm-hmm. to like, you know, kind of take care of it. Run the so, show. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so they invited me to, to make a record with them. And so I said, yeah, for sure, I'd love to. And uh, we ended up starting it in uh, Kingston, Ontario, in their rehearsal spot. And then we uh, migrated down to New Orleans uh, to uh, what was called Kingsway Studio, which is the, the house that uh, we ended up uh, moving. Dan bought a house in New Orleans, and that's the I turned it into a recording studio and, you know, brought like a big console and put it all in there so so we ended up um you know uh working um in new orleans but the band they they wanted to make a record where you know usually you'll you'll take one song and you'll record it a couple times and you'll pick the best song best tape they didn't want to they didn't want to work that way they wanted to work where they played all the songs from the record in sequential order you know 
in sets. So they would only play it one, the song once, thinking that it would have a freshness to it and it was not going to sound labored by playing it three times and, you know, whatever. And so I was um, two weeks into making the record in New Orleans and we were following this, this process of um, making, uh, you know, these, these every day we do two sets and we, you know, listen to them like, mm, I don't know. And I'm thinking two weeks in and I don't have one, one song yet. And I'm thinking, right. How is this, how is this going to work? And I was like, and so uh, I ended up talking to Daniel Lamois, you know, because working with you too is a very hard deal too, because you know it's like they don't have songs when they start. And so I said, Dan, what do I do? And he says, You got to get up early in the morning and find all the best bits of all those songs and glue them together. And then so oh, no. I did. I got up early and I cut all the songs together, and not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I would say, this is the last song from last night. What do you think about this one? And they go, oh, this one's really good. And I said, okay, let's use this one. <laughs> so, so I had to kind of get some under my belt, uh, kind of cheating a little bit on them. But, but the funny thing about it was, is uh, years later, I, I'm uh, at a festival in uh, Gord Downey. He's playing there and um, with, a, with another band. And he came up and he goes, Mark, I know what you did. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He goes, I'm the lyricist. I don't use I don't use the same lines all the same time. So I can I could see what you were doing, but you, I liked it. And I thought you did some really good uh, choices of, you know, because I would just lift those lines that he never did on this other take and glue them together. And it's like it became a little bit more mysterious songwriting wise. Right. And so, yes. Yeah, so, so he he was uh, I don't know if the band really was take picked up on it, but uh Definitely, uh, he but did. Gore did. So was, Gore did, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I felt, you know, okay, at least he liked. But in the, yeah, and then he, they were on tour another time, and I stopped into the show, and he goes, "Day for Night's the only record that I like to listen to." <laughs> I thought, okay, well, thanks. Yeah. So it's like uh, out of all their records, I thought, and it was, and that's ended the one up, that you worked uh, on, right? That's the one that you worked yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day for yeah, Night, right? Yeah. Okay. Day for Night. And so when we finished that record, uh, they were signed to this record company called MCA. And um, uh, we had to go play it for MCA and Hollywood and all that stuff. They hated the record. Like, it didn't sound like any of their other records. It wasn't like a rock record like they normally make. Right. It was kind of like a more abstract, a stranger vibe and, and uh, kind of unique kind of sounds that they people weren't used to hearing so a lot of people you know like what the hell is this shit and so the record company said this this is career suicide you put this out this your 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 career will fail and so they said no we like this record we're putting it out and so sure enough they put it out and i think it was one of their biggest selling records so um there you right. go funny hey? that's funny how that works yeah, yeah. <laughs> take that yeah. mca right <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, so so, you know, like I'm two weeks into it, I'm not getting any takes and I'm freaking out. And so and we're eating pizza and pasta, all this like heavy food from New Orleans. And, and I said, Look, let's have a barbecue and let's have some. So sure enough, we have a barbecue and uh, we get like three songs. Bang, bang, bang. Like, wow, that's good. And like the next day, we, you know, we go back and everybody has pizza and pasta and you get z nothing. And I said, oh. that's it. We're only going to have barbecue for the rest of this record. And we only ate red meat. And, and sure enough, the red meat was the thing that like really like, uh, uh, you know, they they would smoke probably, I'd say, a quarter pound of weed a week. And you know, <laughs> cases and cases of beer that is like they just I don't know how they didn't get big and fat at that point because right. like that, the amount of uh consumption of beer you think right. that they were just bloat but they didn't but i love that i love mark that you cut out the carbs because that's the ticket you cut out the carbs and went straight protein with the barbecue and then stuff it was them. black and white black <laughs> and white sure enough it's like and so iggy pop the same <laughs> way it's like like iggy like i do you uh you work out like you got your whole body. So like, you know, yeah, like I know body fats. Yeah. 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 He's like nothing. And he goes, Nope. Uh, I go, well, what do you do? And so uh, he'd only eat like, you know, straw, like kind of steak or, uh, and vegetables or whatever. And so that's all he would eat every day. That was his diet. And, 
Yeah. And then he said uh, that, that he did these like Chinese breathing exercises and you'd breathe oxygen and then push it all, all parts of his body. And that would keep him, you know, like uh, this kind of like technique that he had that had kept him. He said in the eighties, he got kind of fat, but then he, he got out of it. And so he, you know, stayed pretty trim after that, but. I thought it right, was that's, interesting. That, that is super interesting. You know what, Mark? We're getting a ton of comments in, and I feel like I just want to, first of all, give a huge shout out to my show sponsors, uh, Writers and Rockers cool. Coff, Coffee Company. Uh, I have yep. here tonight Harlequin's Sweet Things and Life Blend. So, all of these famous Canadian rock bands have endorsed their own coffee through Writers and Rockers, if you haven't heard of them. So, okay. So, yeah, yeah. so big, big shout out to those guys. Uh, Doug Corby's in the house, Sean and Lorraine. Hello, Lee Canfield. Uh, the legend himself, Lee, saying, great show, just loving this. So that's for you, Mark. Uh, great. Good to, see you. good to see you, Lee. Uh, Gary Jones, Rod Cahoon, uh, love the stories about the hip. Andy Christ is asking, and I think we may have answered this, but you might have a different answer, Mark. Who is the highest maintenance or diva performer you've ever had to work with? Mm, the highest, the Black Crows. Total oh. divas. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah, do you want yeah, to elaborate yeah. on that? They all had these little sacrament bags with like the pot in them. They they wouldn't share it and they would just like smoke it to themselves. And they thought they were like the the coolest band in the world. And it's like, but they were awful. It was terrible. They were doing like a Bob Marley cover, and it was like the worst thing I ever heard. And it was just like, and they'd order all this catering and all this food, and nobody ate it. And it was, I just thought. These guys are full of themselves. It's like I didn't, you know. And they're like, oh, and we had like organs all over the whole studio. Some on the third floor, and they wanted me to bring them all down. It's like, it's, organs are huge, and so they had me right. like running around with my head chopped off, and Aww. they all sounded good. So, but uh, anyways, yeah. So they were they were the most obnoxious band that uh, I had worked, and you know the brothers were, you know you know, not very happy with each other and at you know, each other's arguing. throats. I've heard that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, thank, I, thank so, you for being so candid about that. And I just think, you know, black crows share your lead. Like what is up with that? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> you can't, you can't make a song by Bar Bob Marley and not share your weed. <laughs> right. So, right. That's, it's a, yeah. yeah. Right on. So in 2019, you wrote your first book. I want to get to the book here. Uh, you wrote your first yep. book listen up yep uh, yeah and then now uh is the book out now your new book or is it just on the cusp uh, of coming out it's just on the cuffs comes out uh november 1st uh it's called recording icons slash creative spaces and um what it is it's uh for the last 30 years i've been either taking photos or uh doing what's called time lapse photography where i just put my camera on a speaker or or in the studio somewhere and it just takes uh, multiple shots every, you know, 30 seconds or whatever. Right. So you get, you get interesting uh, footage of Neil Young singing or just, you know, just hanging out. And so that none of them are posed, you know, like, you know, as soon as you hold a camera up to somebody, they kind of turn like, you know, they, they look different, you know, right. So right. capturing them. So it's kind of like, you know, like a national geographic capturing these animals and their natural, uh, habitat. habitat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And so, yeah. So, so I've got beautiful <clears> shots <throat> of all that of of Neil and Bob and Joni Mitchell and jo and so. Um, <clears throat> but then I also have beautiful photos of all of the locations that I've built and stu studios. There's, I think, there's three or three three kind of big major uh, studios that um, was a long term. The one was in New Orleans, which was Kingsway, and that Great. was in the French Quarter. And that's the one uh, I made uh, two records with REM there, and and Emmy Lou Harris's records was done there, and Eggies. And and then after that, I kind of uh, relocated to California, and that's where the Teatro, the 1940s Mexican porno cinema, uh, came. And that was like another five year stint there, and you know worked with U2 and Bob and and uh, the red hot chili peppers and so that uh, everybody's wow. west coast there yeah and then uh uh and then in um in uh, right in hollywood i took over this uh, 1920s movie star estate called uh um uh that was uh what was it called uh, paramore 
uh, the Paramore. And so what it was is like a, in 1940s, there was a movie star called Antonio Marino, who was the Latin lover of the screen before Rudolph Valentino. And so he married a woman called Daisy Canfield, who was the oil uh, as, um, tycoons of Los Angeles, the uh, Doheny, uh, uh, Canfield Dohenies. So she, her father built this huge 22 room mansion Imagine. right at the top of Silver Lake. And it was that Olympic size pool, all marble line. It was like, you know, beautiful. And so what had happened is uh, they died mysteriously and ended up giving it to these nuns. And it became like a, uh, a school for wayward girls and Tom Petty would say he would always hop over the fence and, you know, <laughs> go smoke with the, the girls and stuff there. And, and so I ended up there for probably about five years and made records with Lucinda Williams and Tom Waits. I started Tom's record there and, and uh, Vic Chestnut and Cheryl Crow. And so, yeah, so it became like my little movie star hangout uh, place. And so uh, uh, I was there for uh, quite a few years and, so uh, I left there and ended up uh, going to make that record with Tom Waits called Real Gone. Right. And after that, after that, then I kind of I've been on a mission ever since then. It just I just kind of go around the world finding cool places. I'd went to Australia uh, to make a record with Sam Roberts and and I rented an old church that was an old bed and breakfast. And, and so we were there on. The record company didn't want us to go because they thought we were just going to go smoke weed and, <laughs> and surf for the whole record, which we did. Which you, I'm just going to say, I'm sure you did. <laughs> but, uh, Part time. But yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was called Bridge to Nowhere with Sam Roberts. And I think that was a, right. a pretty big record for him here in Canada. And uh, yeah, so I've go to uh, Berlin, uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, Bora Bora, you know, like you name it, all these exotic places I just got find cool places, bring my gear set up. And, uh, and I've got everything down to a, like a couple, like maybe four road cases right. and I fly with it. And I just kind of go into these places, make records with people. And it allows me to work in places that, that, you know, you, cause there's no big budgets anymore. Like I, I grew up in right. the day where, you know, it'd be two, 250,000 to 500,000, just a budget to make a record. And now, you're lucky if it's twenty five thousand dollars or whatever, and so right. you got to figure out how to make these records. And so I just rent these cool Airbnb places. Everybody lives there. I bring in a, a cook, and they cook our meals for us. And within wow. you know five five days, we got a great record. And so, right. and, and you know, it, yeah. I would imagine, Mark, so, that you know, choosing all these, and I find it interesting that you mentioned that you had an interest in architecture, and all these years later. You know, you're finding these exotic places with exotic architecture and whatnot. And I would imagine that the ambience and atmosphere definitely lends to having a certain vibe as far as a recording experience goes. Yeah. When, like, when did like, you like, realize that? When did you get it in your head that, you know, it makes a difference if you're surrounded by, you know, a certain right. location um, ambience and that? It, it started with the Neville Brothers, the Yellow Moon record. You Way know, like I then. went out... I went went to the swamp and I got swamp moss and I hung all the swamp moss from that thing and I got like stuffed bobcats and alligator heads and <laughs> and then like all cool like tie dye and and Indian tapestries and I just made it like hippies because they're they're really you know the the Neville brothers were like a hippie kind of band they opened up for the Grateful Dead for years you know? right right and so they, they 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 had that kind of cult following so it kind of started there and then so I ended up. You know, I travel with couches and lamps and all kinds of rugs. And so it was like uh, it got kind of crazy after a while. It was like a transport trailer full of stuff. And we me and Lamois, we went down to Mexico and, you know, I had to get a 24 foot, you know, transport trailer to bring all the gear down. Right. And and, and same with Tom Waits record. I had like a full truck with motorcycles in it and he helped me unload it. It was pretty incredible. <laughs> like there's, no, that's there's a Tom humble Waits man, helped right? me. Yeah, yeah. See, so the the, like, the black crows would ne the black crows would never have done that. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they would make me do it by myself. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and you know, Mark, you you have overcome you know not just the one challenge of of you know the motorcycle accident, which incidentally, I wonder how you see this now totally changed the trajectory of of your career. I would imagine. So looking back, I mean, I I don't want to say is it something you're grateful for, but it definitely change the course of your life 
that yes, accident, well, right? I've, that accident uh, did uh, uh, it did take a left turn for that, and uh, you know I, I recently went through cancer, and right. so that's another uh, that was a big turnaround for me also. You know, and like it really uh, I really hate to say it, but it may have been one of the best things that ever happened to me because uh, I have a different outlook on life, and right. I just uh, I just live every day to the, the, the most, and I do everything I can, and uh, I'm. I'm I, I just had like a, a a bit of a scare and I thought I was not going to make it. And, and so I found out it was a, it, it, it was a bad scan on my brain. And they thought they were, they had like this whole thing where they, all these uh, doctors were thinking, you know, I wasn't going to make it. And so, uh, so I ended up, uh, I must've moved during the scan and this black dot appeared in my brain. And oh, so they wanted me, so I rescanned and, I mean, amazingly it was not there and so wow so right away so right away i just kind of i booked some tickets to go to thailand with my daughters uh, at christmas wow. time I was like that's it i'm going to thailand freaking <laughs> so, right uh, yeah i was gonna yeah, i was gonna ask God, you i mean it's got to change your perspective on things when you've been given a get out totally. of jail free card like that like wow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but, and a but you are times. cancer you are cancer free now though correct yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. Uh, it's been two years off of the program, and uh, I'm 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 lucky. I I didn't do chemotherapy. I I took this other road. It was a uh, um uh a, 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 it was called immune therapy, and so it, instead of stripping your body of all of everything, it actually boosts your body with um with uh, uh, more kind of positive uh, uh you know um. Chem more, I guess that it is chemicals, but right. but it's 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 immune immune system booster. So what it was is I had a a little tiny uh, black dot on my shoulder, and I had the um, dermatologist cut it off, and he never checked for cancer. And so what happened was oxygen got in there, and right. that can made the cancer spread throughout my body, and I ended up with stage four cancer. It was in my liver, in my spleen, and my brain. And uh, nobody thought I would ever make it. And so through this clinical trial, I had to come to Toronto. There's an amazing doctor there called uh, Marcus Butler. And he's like a master at um, uh, Princess Margaret Hospital. And he kind of developed this whole kind of uh, immune therapies kind of treatment for people. And he said, it only works on 40% of the people. And we don't know if it's going to work on you. I can keep you alive for maybe a year. And I'm like, oh, my God, because chemotherapy was killing every immune uh, um, kind of skin cancer patient. So I was very right. lucky to be able to be the first to try it. And, and it didn't have harsh side effects. I had a little bit of itchiness. I was always itchy and scratching, but other than that, minor. Uh, it was yeah. not minor, minor compared to like all these other harsh cancer pay, uh, treatments that people go on. So I'm, I'm lucky I, I got through it. And so, right. yeah, so I, I I'm, I'm, I'm putting this book out and I kind of, uh, it's a, it's a thrill for me to kind of share, you know, like the other book was kind of more of a reading book and all these stories this time around, you get to see what it looked like in these, in these places that I found and, and what the, the artists look like there. Cause the, uh, I had to write about how it was looked. And so this way, you know, you can really see it on this on this book. Yeah, right, it's, it's very book. it's very visual. Guys, watching if uh, yeah. this book is uh, um, I was privileged enough. Mark sent me um, some excerpts and basically a copy, a preview copy of the book, and I got to see some of the photos and and so basically, if you want more of what we've been talking about tonight, that's what the book offers: it's, it's stories yeah. and anecdotes, beautiful photos of different locations and different artists. And where can we find the book, Mark? Uh, it's a, it's going to. Yeah, it's available right now on Amazon pre-order and uh, November 1st, it comes out. And then uh, you can also buy it at ECW Books, which is my uh, publishing company. And it will be in all of the big, uh, you know, um, bookstores across Canada and, and America, you know, borders in America and uh, up here, what is it, chapters and... Chapters, right. Um, Indigo. Yeah, yeah. Indigo, that's, yeah, those are the right. two big ones. So, so it'll be available through them. And I'll be uh, if you uh, somewhere along the road, you'll I'll be doing some book signing book and uh, yeah, so there'll be quite a few book signings coming up. And so uh, look for uh, um, my Instagram uh, um, 
MH Real Music, uh, and uh, you, you'll I'll always post where I am at. So all right, an and I will, trip. Yep. and I will share it. I will share that with the viewers yep. too when when that comes okay. out. And hopefully, hopefully you come to my neighborhood. One last question for you, yep. Mark, before we let you go, because it, it's like eleven o'clock where you are right now. By the way, viewers, yep. <laughs> so you're in North Scotia, <laughs> but uh, you're a night owl, yep. obviously. What are you most yep. proud of, Mark? When you think about you know your experiences in your career, what what are you the most proud of? Um, you know, I'm, there's, uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I'm most proud of and, you know, like probably the Dylan records for sure. And then I did a strange record with Neil and I, I really enjoyed that. Like, you know, with Neil Young, like, how am I going to better his guitar sound from him? Like, oh my God. But I right. did. And, uh, and it made him, I never seen him smile so big, you know, like, wow, this is great. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so. Yeah, so I think the, those were, and, you know, working with Robert Plant, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I did some nice work uh, uh, with, with all those records, and I I think that the biggest reward is is when when people come to me and they say, that's my favorite record, and, or you've made a lot of my favorite right. records, and, and so um, I remember Feist had come up to me uh, one time, and, and she said, I was really sick, I was on the bus, and and I listened to that uh, Lucinda Williams record, World Without Tears, and that record saved me. And he, she goes, I just listened to that over and over again. It was so beautiful. And, and thank you. You know, like <laughs> that was like a, one Quite of her wrong, saving, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So I think that's that's the, the greatest rewards that I, I get from doing this job. And, and you know, uh, every record I make, I just still have the, the, the kind of gumption to kind of, recreate everything i can you know and and by moving into different places you discover new sounds and and i i have like this little uh kind of road show that i travel with so it's uh it keeps keeps me going i i'm i, I get a little itchy when i'm staying still so and, i would imagine uh, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but uh i i gotta learn to be able to relax a little bit too and that's I think my little trip to Thailand will help me relax. <laughs> right. Yep. Well, good for you. I just, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and being me being your first interview, allowing me to privilege yes, being the thank first you. interview. Uh, no, thank yep. you uh, regarding the book. So once again, guys, Mark yep. Howard's new book, um, you'll, it'll be out in all the usual, all the usual suspects is where you can find it. Amazon. In, in yep. in the, so, yeah. So thank you so much, Mark, for, for taking You're time welcome. tonight. Um, we yep. wish you continued success and continued health for sure. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. And yeah, yep. thank all you, thank all you guys for tuning in. Special thanks to Writers and Rockers Coffee Company for being my show sponsors. Uh, until we see you next week, everybody, be nice and kind to each other. And we'll be here next week with Dave Betts of Honeymoon Suite. Until there, mm. till then, oh, take care, stay safe and sane, and. We'll